Siegfried Horn, um, since the time he was a boy, he was fascinated with archaeology and, and wanted to travel and work there. But his uh, life experience didn't allow that to happen until after World War II, where he had been uh, interned as a prisoner. And he came to the United States and finished up his uh, college at Walla Walla College and then went to uh, study with Albright in uh, Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, but Albright, after testing him out, said, look, uh, we can't just give you a degree and you know all this stuff, so why don't you go do something new? Go to the University of Chicago and get a degree in Egyptology. So that's what he did. And um, he began teaching uh, at the seminary. And uh, he had this longing, you know, to, uh, to dig. So he contacted uh, Giornist Wright, who was digging at Shechem in those days and had a group of um, mature in, uh, scholars working with him and Siegfried got some dig experience uh, and then he began to to want to do his own project and so he contacted the greats in uh, the history of uh, archaeology and, and the Hebrew Bible and uh, the only site on the list that each of these scholars gave him as potential places that needed to be excavated was Heshbon the original goal was primarily a search for the biblical past in Jordan because the professors who, who organized the dig and the sponsors were interested in that period in particular. They were not especially interested in the Romans even or much less even the prehistoric people or the Islamic people. But the fact is that an archaeological mound is what it is. And when you start digging, you cannot just say, well, I'm not interested in this, so I'll bulldoze it away. So it turns out that the best preserved layers in the site actually come from the later Islamic periods. There were also a great deal of well-preserved um, architecture from the Greek or Roman period. And from the biblical period, actually we have loose finds such as pottery and bones but very little in the way of architecture. It just did not date early enough. And so, as I have um, said in other places, because of his broad-mindedness and because of the pluck of graduate students who were part of this project, there was this broadening of the vision. What can we learn? What kind of new avenues can, uh, can we explore? And in the process, um, the Madava Plains project came to be known, yes, seriousness about biblical studies, but willingness to let the evidence be part of the conversation, but also the kinds of questions that anthropology asks. I mean, so Siegfried Horn comes with historical questions. Others came, like Dr. Sin LaBianca, with anthropology questions. So what can we know about what really governed people's lives? What, what archaeologically uh, could we put together in a system? After I was done excavating at Hespan, after four or five seasons of digging there, uh, we wanted to do something at a site that had bronze and iron age. Hespan had a bit of Iron Age, but it was kind of hidden and difficult to get to. And so there was a site nearby that we wanted to excavate that had Bronze and Iron Age. This was Tel Jalul. However, we couldn't get a permit to dig there for various reasons. We tried in 1982, but somebody had claimed to find the Ark of the Covenant in Mount Nebo and that made everybody in the Madaba region or Jalul region really nervous. And so they didn't give us a permit. And so we decided we were going to excavate another site that had Bronze and Iron Age. That was Tel Alameri. And I'm very glad that happened <laughs> because we made some really sensational finds at Tel Alameri. Um, and we found the Bronze and Iron Age really nicely. Some of the best preserved remains in Jordan from those periods. After a few years of working at Tel el uh suddenly the permit came through, 1992 I believe it was, and Jalul was suddenly available after wanting it for many years. Uh, we couldn't dig, but suddenly we could. And we got the news late in the season. We'd already got everything together. We were over there planning and working at Tel el Umeri, And uh, when we arrived, we were suddenly told, you can dig at Jalul. Uh, Larry Garrity, Sten LaBianca, Larry Hur, or you had other 
plans for that season. Since I was the junior director of the consortium, uh, they said, you get to go dig Jalul. So I quickly scraped together a team. Uh, Dave Merling went with me and uh, we started our excavations uh, very quickly there in the beginning of the 1992 season. We knew its implication. We knew uh, the potential that this could be an alternate candidate for biblical Heshbon. And so we wanted to start putting probes down and get an idea of the stratigraphy and the occupational history of the site. There was the big advantage of uh, digging these sites simultaneously and uh, sharing the data as we were finding it at each site with each other so that we could have a broader perspective on interpreting each of the sites. And that was a big advantage. When you have one university or one professor guiding a project, he tends to or she tends to have a myoptic view, you know, sort of tunnel vision. And they tend to hold what they're discovering close to the chest, so to speak. They don't like anyone to know about the discoveries until they think they've got it all figured out and give a perfect presentation of it that no one can dispute. Uh, the problem is that you're kind of working in a tunnel and you may uh, have, you may not know everything that's going on in the region around you and you may come to an erroneous conclusion. With our project, having three major sites working in a broader region plus doing surveys for the hinterland sites, we had a much broader perspective and we were sharing data from each of these sites in real time. So we sort of had a, a quick corrective for any theories or hypotheses we might have had and I think as a result we came to a more accurate uh, historical understanding of uh, what was going on in this region. Well, I've been at Hespan for five seasons. Uh, there's nothing that compares to the, you know, this is sort of the founding father of archaeology for Transjordan. Anybody who's anybody has been at this site and has worked at this site over the last 40 or 50 years. You know, Hespan and our work there came toward the end, you might say, of the traditional way of excavating. And so many people who had specialties that were not thought of previously as being part of an archaeological team did become part of our team. And uh, people look back at us as one of the pioneers of uh, involving the various specialties in the field. Way ahead of its time, way ahead of its time, the use of, of newer models and theories drawn from sociology and anthropology, that was new. In more recent years, it was the impact of the natural sciences. But in every way, the project has always been there, right on the cutting edge. I spent one year in 1982 to 83 writing an excavation manual. First part, how to dig. Second part, what to write in various uh, entries into the forms. And the forms were designed uh, to be used with a computer database. This was before I knew anything about a computer database. It's 1982, 83. I had never seen a computer before at that time, but I knew it needed specific, consistent data. It didn't allow people to say, oh, that stone was head size or fist size or something like that. It gave measurements actually in a boulder, large boulder, cobble, and so on. These were recognized terms within the field of studies of stones. We used um, recognized terms in soil science. It has set the debates, and particularly for Mamluk studies. This is now the, the case study, not just for archaeologists, but for historians of the Mamluk period, and that's something special. Not too many people can say that they've been on a, they're part of a five decade history research project. Um, it's international. Um, it has evolved in special ways, even with the 20 years that I've been here. Um, and it has a community side that makes it grounded in the realities of, of local and everyday life. I think perhaps today, more than ever, the expedition has provided a bridge to a region that is very misunderstood and feared. We, we uh, this season, had some 55 students from 18 different countries and they discover that the families that were our partners in providing food and work are the same as the families that they know back home. One of the aspects of doing this, guiding and, and, and working here that I enjoy the most is introducing students for the first time to the Holy Land, to the topography, to the landscapes, and to the people of Jordan. 
In previous years, we've actually uh, excavated here in the morning and we leave at 11.30 or 12 and go back to the hotel in Madaba for lunch and, and pottery washing and, and writing. This year, though, is different. We actually stay here and walk down to the Women's Community Center here at Hispan and have lunch. And that has been a very, very special time of interaction, of uh, involvement, and getting to know the community on a one-to-one -one personal basis. Food's great, but also just meeting people and uh, outside of the site and uh, getting to know the community has been fantastic. Uh, I prepare the food, breakfast and lunch uh, for students and for guests. Um, I'm very, very happy because I have a friend from um, different countries around the world. This is fantastic for me. Every, I mean, people here are like more like welcoming and friendly than like people in America. So, you know, it's really nice to see how generous and like open people are. And I mean, it's beautiful, really. I mean, the scenery is just like amazing. You know, when I when we were at Mount Nebo, like over, and we could like kind of like see the Dead Sea and everything. I was kind of speechless. It's just so beautiful here. I love it. This is probably the best experience I've ever like, you know, had. This is something I've never had the opportunity to do. So it's actually my first time leaving the country. So it's just been like surreal, really. And I'm, I mean, I, I want to come back. I mean, this has just been incredible for me. So I would tell everybody to come, you know. I didn't know about Bedouins. I didn't know how they lived or that they existed even. And so seeing the, the tents and them living in the caves and stuff, I was not prepared for that at all. I, I actually encourage two people and they're here now. So um, yeah, I would definitely recommend to at least, I don't know, try if you like it and uh, see what happens with you. Yeah. Um, I like to spend my summers here and I always try to come back. Um, it gives me kind of like, it's a home away from home. So I've met great connections that I have been friends with since 2010 that I still keep in contact with. And coming back and seeing them every couple years has been a lot of fun. We are in our uh, field, we are in our trends. A Greek girl, an American girl, a girl from Japan, and a girl from Egypt. Mm -hmm. So we're like, we're from everywhere. And I like that. Getting to know people in the field, both those of us who came from outside as well as our Jordanian team, that was also uh, a real privilege and uh, a high point. Uh, one interesting story, uh, when we were coming to the conclusion of our work at uh, Heshban, and we had cleaned up the site, ready for the final photographs and so on, a uh, helicopter uh, circled overhead and <laughs> landed on one of our dumps and outstepped King Hussein. And he said, um, what are you doing here? I know that you've been digging. I understand that you're coming to the conclusion. He said, how about giving me a tour? So of course we gave him a tour of the site. And when he was uh, done, before he got into the helicopter, he said, is there anything I can do to help you with your work? And I said, well, for several months, we've been trying to get a permit from the Air Force to go up in a little plane and take aerial shots. And uh, if you could put in a good word for us, I said, uh, that would be a tremendous help. And he said, well, do you have your camera with you? And I said, yes. So he said, well, hop in. And so we got into the helicopter and uh, circled the site. And he opened the door and, you know, tipped the, the helicopter. So we looked straight down. He went around and around. We got all the pictures we wanted. So uh, that's how we got our first aerial sights. Most big digs last maybe 20 years. That's a long running project. Um, there are very few that last 30 years. 50 years is unheard of. Most people do this for a while and give up. Uh, but this long running project is really remarkable. There's nothing like it. 